Thanks very much. And good morning, everybody. I don't know if it's a great idea to be the last speaker of the morning, but uh, I am, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle it. Um, I think what we've seen this morning is, is a lot of talk about regional issues and, and community-based issues. Uh, my presentation is more right at the homeowner level, and that also feeds into the wellness of a community, is what a homeowner does and how it, a homeowner makes their, uh, decisions. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do is talk about what homeowner expectations are versus sometimes what the reality might have to be, what some of the pressures are on lawns in urban Newfoundland and Labrador, and lawn issues are an urban issue. It's not so much a rural uh, concern. As well, we'll go into some of the efforts that we've gone through to reduce the unnecessary use of pesticides and look at what some f future considerations might be for, for this whole process. I have a question for you. Do you own or manage a lawn? Uh, whether you own the thing or you're renting, uh, do you have some lawn area that you or somebody in your family is responsible for? Yes or no? One is yes, two is no. This is so exciting. I'm going to get one of these from my husband. <laughs> and, and there will be no answer that is grunt is an A, grunt choice is B. I think we're there. So most people in the room do have some kind of, a, of affiliation with a lawn. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if, if this is your expectation of what a lovely landscape environment might look like but in a lot of cases it's what people think that this is where they're supposed to go to or it's their ideal or their dream um, landscape feature or they want the big house they want the nice landscaping features all around it by the way absolute nightmare if you're trying to control airwigs with this type of landscape right up against the foundation I'm not going there today I only got 15 minutes but this is the reality of where we start in Newfoundland and Labrador Okay, this is the beginning of a subdivision, and what we are doing is we're taking evergreen forest and turning it into housing developments. Next question. If you do have a lawn, how deep is the soil underneath your lawn? The soil, now not, not until you go down and you bend your shovel with the, with the bedrock, but how deep is the soil that's underneath your lawn? If you don't know, please answer number one, but your choices are less than two inches for one, Number two is between two to six inches of topsoil. And number three would be I have greater than six inches of topsoil underneath that lawn that I'm looking after. Isn't this just amazing? <laughs> I think we're, are we there? If you don't know, then just say, okay, I don't know. I'll just go number one. It's a lot easier for people who've put the lawn in themselves to know the answer to this question. So we've got um, 18 people, or 18% 18 saying that they have greater than six inches, and everybody else is saying it's not quite there. One of the biggest impediments impediments to having a nice lawn is the fact that we don't have enough topsoil ordinarily to keep that lawn alive. We are really, really struggling with this whole issue is, okay, if we want to have people to have healthy lawns, then we've got to educate them on the topsoil matter. But then on the other side of the coin is we don't have naturally occurring topsoil re reserves that you can go to and get your topsoil. A lot of the topsoil that's being sold right now is being created. They take fill, they add peat moss to it, and they call it soil and charge you a fortune for it. For most housing subdevelopments, and I'm not talking about a single home out in, in a, a rural area, but for some of these, these new sort of uh, developments that go in, all of the topsoil is transported to that site. First thing that happens, if you've bought a piece of land that's been farmland or something like that, first thing you harvest off it is the sod, and you sell that if you're a contractor. Then you take all the topsoil, and you take that away, and you sell that to the last subdivision that you probably built. 
if you're a contractor sometimes. And then what you do is you build your houses and then you bring your topsoil back. There is no reservoir with what's there now to assist with soil requirements. There's nothing there that's going to keep anything alive. In some cases, they'll put just enough topsoil down to keep the rocks from coming through the sod. Okay? We're basically growing grass hydroponically in this type of situation. <laughs> Anybody's ever tried to do that, you know what you're up against. Topsoil requirements, a lot of people will say, oh, three or four inches is good, especially if it's sod, and that makes no sense at all because once the grass is established, it's established. Uh, the minimum that we should be aiming for is six inches. When I did a, a review of Kentucky bluegrass soil requirements, I found that they um, were re re recommending a minimum soil depth of 24 inches. Two feet is where Kentucky bluegrass does really well. We're growing it on this much. Okay, next question. You can't really see it there. Uh, have you ever had a soil test done to determine pH, limestone requirements, nutrient levels, and or a fertilizer recommendation? Have you ever brought your soil into the Department of Agriculture, which is Natural Resources, out on Brookfield Road, same place you go for the Farmer's Field Day, eh? Have you ever brought it in there? They charge it about $20, $25 for a complete soil analysis. Yes is one. No is two. Thank you for your honesty. This is so cool. Um, I think what we're seeing here is a normal representation of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians by and large. Okay? This is not a shock to me. Might be to you guys. Maybe not. I don't know. But if you don't have a soil test done, how do you know what you need? Here's another question for you now, just to go in conjunction with that one. What is more important for healthy lawn growth, applying limestone or using a good quality fertilizer. You can get $30, $40 bags of fertilizer, and you can also buy limestone at the store. So one, applying limestone is more important. Two, using a good quality fertilizer is the more important decision that you have to make. This is my last question, by the way, so should have put more in there. Great job. Um, absolutely, applying limestone is, is the more important uh, of the two. And the reason why I say that is because we've just cut all of those trees off of that soil, if there's any soil left, it's very low in pH. It's got a pretty acidic base. Uh, about 4.5 is our natural soil pH. If you want to grow grass, you've got to get that up to about a 7. And in order to do that, you have to put limestone down. If you don't use the limestone, that $40 bag of high-grade fertilizer, you might as well take that bag of fertilizer and just pour it in the ditch in front of your house, okay? Because that's where it's going to end up anyway. It will be absolutely unavailable to that, that lawn. One of our pressures on lawns in this province is less experienced homeowners. Homeowners who have just bought a new house or they've, you know, they've had the house for a while, but nobody's really told them what to do with that lawn. They know that they've got to have a great lawn because everybody else on the street has one. But what do you do? How do you look after it? You can't tell by the look of the thing what's missing, what that lawn needs. Limestone is critical for allowing nutrients to be taken up by the plants, by the roots. And properly fed lawns are not under stress. Okay? When you have stress in your life or in your lawn, things start to go south. And this is, this is the big thing with, with lawns. And I, I really want to stress on this one. Uh, when I spoke with a, a golf course superintendent who, who actually brought in a couple of the new golf courses in the province, his big deal was, I don't really care about the green. He said, my job is to make where those roots grow the best possible place that those roots can grow. And if I do that, then the green comes on its own. 
So if you want to think about things, what do I need to do to make sure that those roots are nice, creamy white, healthy growing, going down as deep as they possibly can for a whole bunch of important reasons? Another pressure on lawns is the species of grass that we, we basically uh, promote as far as what looks the best in, in your uh, urban environment. And Kentucky bluegrass seems to be the one that most people will move to. This is a double-edged one. It's, it's probably because it's got such a beautiful color. Everybody else has it, therefore I want to get it myself. But it's really not the best fit possibly for a Newfoundland and Labrador situation. It does well in full sunlight. <laughs> okay? Now think about that. Full sunlight in the States, not in a northern climate with fog and cloud and all kinds of stuff. Um, you'll find that your Kentucky bluegrass lawn dies out fastest in the area where your house shades your lawn the most. So you're going to notice yourselves. Um, it likes a nice deep soil. It's not great for, uh, for fighting off chinch bug attacks. There's all kinds of reasons why Kentucky bluegrass is not your best choice. There are other choices out there. But once again, the one that's most uh, often provided to you is the Kentucky bluegrass. So uh, municipal bylaws are also sometimes a pressure on lawns. This is not every community in the province, but a lot of communities will have a, a rule where you've got to have a grass lawn, one or two trees, and a paved driveway before you move in. And this puts a lot of pressure on a homeowner who's gone to the bank, maxed out their mortgage to whatever size house they can put on that lot, and then they've got to worry about the landscaping. But one of the things that we want to do is, is encourage people to look at the landscaping as well when they're talking about taking ownership of a, of a home. Uh, topsoil requirements, if they're in a community, if they're in a municipal bylaw, topsoil requirements might not always be enforced. What we've been doing is we've been working with homeowners and lawn care service providers for the past 15 or 20 years um, on a few uh, different sort of approaches that we've gone to. We've done some education pieces. There's also legislation pieces that have been undertaken and are continuing to be done and as well as societal norms. They play a factor here as well. Uh, we've spent, I think since 1996, we've, got, we've uh, hosted or uh, sponsored turf conferences for industry, and we talk about all kinds of different ways to manage that lawn without the use of pesticides. Homeowner gardening group talks, we have gone out and done talks to women's institutes, to communities, to just about any type of, of group that we can get together. And, uh, you know, if we have to, we'll pull people off the street and lock the doors. But we really feel that it's really important to explain to people why they're having problems with their lawn. Uh, we've also done some print material, and, um, and that works as well, but it's nothing like a, a chat face-to-face. -face. There's... Two minutes? Okay. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that people have to learn about in order to have a proper lawn. And, you know, just knowing it is one thing. Behavior is sometimes a lot harder. It's the same thing as we heard this morning. Yeah, you know you have to exercise and eat properly and, and not smoke, but changing your behavior to actually do that is, is a really big deal. This is our Backyard Bug Brigade. It's uh, on our website, and it just talks about some of the pests that you meet in and around uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Airwigs are there, but there's nothing you can do with an airwig. Um, legislation efforts we have been ongoing. Um, we have reduced. We used to have th people were selling packages of three herbicide treatments and two insecticide treatments and all this. Uh, we brought that down to you're only allowed to do one broadcast a year. We cut from 2005, we had a nas or, sorry, national, I'm just thinking the olden days. We had a provincial number of um, the amount of, of 2,4-D mecoprop and dicamba, which is known mostly as Killex, those types of things. We went from 7,000 liters for the entire province in 05 to in 2009 under 2,000 liters just by reducing the number of times you can spray those lawns for, for weed control. We took weed and feed type products out of homeowners' hands. They didn't even realize there was a herbicide in those products. The people selling it didn't know. 
How can the, how can the, the purchaser know? Uh, municipalities, we've had one or two municipalities bring in topsoil requirements. Are they always enforced? It's, it's a tough one. And uh, Minister uh, Wiseman in July announced that as of the next growing season, we will have a ban on commonly used pesticides for lawns. So those are legislation efforts. We have to stop the idea where people think that they have to have a beautiful lawn with nothing else in that but Kentucky bluegrass. This is the t time when you can really do something with how that landscape is going to be handled. We just, I, I, I can't believe, you know, the types of things that, that we see here. But this is not unnatural, un unusual, I should say. You know, by the time the next season rolls around, that thing is dead. There's dandelions everywhere. Societal norms. Lawns are a fashion, a fashion statement. Okay, I don't know where lawns came from, but when I was little, you weren't allowed to play it in front of the house until the hay was mowed off it. After that, you could play there. Nobody wanted to because if you ever fell down, you'd be impaled by the blades that were left. But anyway, we learned how to run and not fall down in Torbay. All we have to do is change what's fashionable. That's all. It's, it's simple. Yeah, and it'll take decades probably. I don't know. But let's look at some, some other things that we can do for our landscape. You know, choose other features. If you like nice, flat, open areas, then go with a new ground cover. Go with something different. The botanical gardens have all kinds of things to, uh, to show you what looks nice. One of the things Neil mentioned was vegetable gardens. Uh, I'm from Torbay. Uh, this past summer, we put a quarter-acre garden in the back for ourselves as well as for our dog's babysitter. And he said, you know, basically as far as, as uh, the benefits, we did have some fabulous produce. Um, but the, the bigger benefit, I think, was, was watching that, that uh, our neighbor, our babysitter, just he brought people to the place. He was there three and four times a day. He was the happiest hoer in Torbay. <laughs> and I think the world needs more hoers. Okay, so it's, it's not just the, the physical, here's fresh vegetables, it's the psychological and the mental um, benefits that you get from having just a little difference in your landscape. We wouldn't have gotten them down to mow the lawn for us three and four times a day. And following areas to revert to natural vegetation. You know, we, we've got beautiful uh, scenes along the East Coast Trail, and why are we tearing those types of, of natural landscapes up so that we can look like Florida. I don't know, but that's, that's where we are with it. Um, I don't think I've got too much else to tell you. Um, basically, what, what my conclusion would be for you uh, is we really have to look as a group, and I think this is a fabulous um, venue for this, this whole discussion, but we have to look at all of the inputs that have to be considered. Do we have enough water to keep watering lawns? Do we have enough soil to keep planting lawns? Um, look at all of the reasons why we want to possibly maybe change some of the things we're doing right now. Properly well-established lawns can be absolutely gorgeous. I'm not discounting that for a second. We're kind of letting the moss grow in you know, ours because the bunny rabbits are happier there. Um, you know, we'd like to put our money into fertilizer for the vegetable garden. I won't tell you what our, our neighbor, our babysitter, said the morning he came down after the night the moose had been there and ate all his cabbage. <laughs> but still in all, um, that's where we're putting our money, not for to fertilize the lawn, but to fertilize the vegetable garden. And we can select alternatives to lawns. It's, it's possible. Sometimes you need a little municipal tweaking. Sometimes you don't. So, but it's, sometimes it's just the educational piece. I think that pretty well does it for me. Thank you very much.